Yesterday we looked at polynomial theorems. Today, some results that come from those. So the first one, here we go. If we know a polynomial has k different zeros, let's call them a1, a2, a3, up to ak, then each of those would produce a linear factor by the factor theorem. So therefore we know that x minus a1 is a factor, so is x minus a2, so is x minus a3. So there logically, what we get when we multiply all those factors together must be a factor. That's basically what this is saying. So we're going to show that 1 and negative 2 are in fact zeros of this quartic and then go and factorise the quartic altogether. So subbing in 1, yes, we get 0. Subbing in negative 2, yep, we get 0 again. And so we know that 1 and negative 2 are both zeros. Therefore, x minus 1, x plus 2 must be a factor. All right, let's factorise. I'm actually going to expand out the x minus 1, x plus 2, because to do it logically, it makes life a lot easier. Because now I can go leading term times leading term must give me leading term. Therefore, it starts off with x squared. Constant times constant must give me constant. So it must finish with plus 5. I'll now look at the x's. At this stage, I have 5x. I want 5x. So it looks like I'm, I'm factorised. Now, if you're uncomfortable and unsure, let's try, what could we try? The um, x, well, let's try the x cubes. At this stage, I would have x times x squared, which is x cubed. We've got x cubed. We want x cubed. So yeah, it is working fine. So that second factor just stays as x squared plus 5. Well, that one doesn't factorise down, not with real numbers anyway. We get x minus 1, x plus 2, x squared plus 5 for our factorisation. Okay, so the next one. If we know a polynomial is of degree n, and we know there are n distinct zeros, a1, a2, and so on, then that must be the polynomial. x minus a1, x minus a2, x minus a3, x minus a n. Or some multiple, of it, I guess you could have a, you know, everything times 2 or so on. Which brings up this one. You cannot have more than the degree of the polynomial. So if a polynomial is of degree n, you can't have more than n zeros. Now, this is where we're talking about real ones. When you start talking about imaginary ones as well, which we'll see later in extension two, uh, you will always have n zeros. Okay, let's have a look at this. We have a polynomial. We know it has a double zero. That just means that zero appears twice, so when you factorise it, you'd have that linear factor squared. And a single zero at two. Write down a possible polynomial. And by a possible polynomial, what they really mean is one that would generalise it and cover every possibility. I know I've got these two factors, x minus two and x plus seven squared. But of course, it could be times another polynomial. So long as that polynomial doesn't have a zero at two or negative seven. If it had a zero at two, then I would now have a double zero. But I've been told it's only got a single one. I could multiply the whole thing by k. It's questionable whether I really need to do that because that k could be inside this random polynomial that I've put there anyway. But I'm just highlighting, hey, I could have any multiple of that would still satisfy the situation. What about if it was a monic polynomial of degree 3? So I'll start by writing down what I know and then say, what else could I have? Well, actually, there's nothing else I could have because that is of degree 3. I've got three zeros, the double zero and the single zero. I can't have more than three. So that's it. And it's monic, so it can't be times a constant. There is only one possible one I could put down for that one. What about if it was monic of degree 4, though? Well, again, I know I've got these two factors, but there might be another linear factor. Well, in fact, there has to be another linear factor. So I'll multiply by x minus a, but a can't be 2 and it can't be negative 7. Otherwise, that would change the double root and the single root. So that. What about if it was a polynomial of degree 5? Again, put down what I know. I know there's now another two roots. Now, I don't write down x minus a, x minus b, something like that. I don't do that. 
because it'll be times a quadratic, but who's to say that quadratic can be factorised? It might not be able to. So I say, no, it's times a quadratic or a polynomial of degree two. And again, it would not have a zero at two or negative seven. I've also put a K out the front to say, yeah, it could be any multiple. But again, that K could, I suppose, be inside that QX. All right, the next idea. And this is where I contradict myself. Because remember in number three, I said, you can't have more zeros than the degree. So number four says, well, if you do, then there's only one possibility. It must be the, what we call the zero polynomial. In other words, polynomial is zero, that single thing. Now, zero is a polynomial. It's weird, I know. What is its degree? Well, is it? Because a degree of zero would imply you have some constant times x to the power of zero. But you don't, because you've got zero. Any degree, or in fact, every degree, and so that's why this must be the zero polynomial. Because we're saying, hey, it's got more than n solutions. It's got an infinite number of solutions. It's always zero. Zero is just a weird, weird number. <laughs> okay. All right. That brings us to the fifth one here. If you've got two polynomials that are congruent... So that's why I've got the three lines there. Just like in geometry, it means exactly the same thing. Remember, it means they are identically equal. They are perfect copies of each other. Then the coefficients of each corresponding term must be equal. So if we're saying this polynomial on the left is congruent to this polynomial on the right, then a1 must equal A2, B1 must equal B2, C1 must equal C2, and so on. They've got to be equal in every single respect. Okay. 10E. We will now play with 